Sutra. He further makes the following reflection. All living beings are within the dangerous roads of birth and death are about to fall into the hells of animals and hungry ghosts. They enter the net of evil views. They are confused by the thick forest of stupidity. They follow different paths and practice inverted conduct. They are like blind people who do not have guides. Roads which do not lead to escape, they think lead to escape. They enter into the state of demons and are seized by evil bandits. They are caught with the demon's mind and become far removed from the Buddha's intentions. I should pull them out of such danger and difficulty and cause them to dwell in the city of the foolishness of all wisdom. Commentary the Bodhisattva on the second ground, the ground of living filth, leaves all afflictions far behind. He also leaves all of his bad habits and faults and all defilement. To have no defilement of mind means to have no thoughts of desire. It means that he has severed desire and cast out love, returned to the origin and gone back to the source. We people are not that way. Ordinary common people, if told to get rid of their desire and cast out love, say, I want to have even more desire, I want to have even more love. If you tell them to have fewer afflictions, then they get angry even more often. They take afflictions and ignorance for food to eat and for clothes to wear, which they cannot do without. At every meal they eat, their feel of afflictions to the point that their stomachs are about to burst, but they still don't know how to stop those afflictions. People are just that kind of stranger, stranger entity. Human beings are especially weak entities among the weak. If you tell people to do things one way, they insist on doing them another way, not following the rules is their talent. When the Bodhisattva sees those kinds of living beings, he pities them, and so he further makes the following reflection. All living beings without exception. What's mean by living beings? It means those who are alive because of a multitude of conditions have come together. It's not one factor alone that makes a person. There are a number of factors involved. They are within the dangerous roads of birth and death. On that dangerous road of birth and death, it is very easy to do wrong. And as soon as one does something wrong, one falls through the three evil destinies. If you perform good, merit, and virtue, you can be born in the heavens or be an asura or a person. But if you commit offenses, then you fall into the house, become hungry ghosts or turn into an animal, and so in a single thought is the homes of heaven, and in a single thought is the house, in a single thought is the fruit of Buddhahood, and in a single thought one is an animal, it's, an, it's all in that single thought, and they are about to fall into the house of animals and hungry ghosts. The danger on that road is that you never know when you are going to fall into the house, Hells are not like human jails. We build the house ourselves. The houses are self-imposed. We prepare our hell, and when our offenses are ripe and our life comes to an end, we go to that hell to undergo suffering. There is the uninterrupted hell. A single person feels that hell, and if everyone went there, each one would feel it. It's full if there is one person, it's full if there are many, and so it's called the unspaced or uninterrupted hell. Time there is also extremely long. Once you fall into the hell, you never get out. Why not? It's due to Devin views. One falls into the hell because of Devin views, or one becomes an animal. There are also millions of types of animals, not just a single kind. There are horses, cows, chickens, pigs, and dogs, each with its own peculiarities. Each species has its own subcategories, which number in the millions. There are millions upon millions of hells, just as 
there are millions upon millions of kinds of animals. Hungry ghosts too have millions of varieties. Some are rich ghosts who have money, but money to them is not several million dollars. For example, as it is in well, it is with people, money to them is great power and spiritual penetrations. Actually, spiritual penetrations is not exactly the right word for it. They are ghost penetrations. Ghosts have five or six, five of six spiritual penetrations, but not the penetration of the extinction of our flows. Those are the rich ghosts. The poor ghosts are the ghosts who have no money. That doesn't mean they lack our pretty printed bills. It means they don't have any power. They have no spiritual penetrations to speak of. They know very little about what's going on. It's not as in China where people burn paper money for the ghosts to use that makes the ghost who's rich. It doesn't work that way. No one has ever proved whether it is of any use to burn paper money for ghosts to use. The way I see it is, if there was some use in burning paper money for ghosts, then when ghosts got that paper money, it would be as when we people strike it rich. That is, if you burn money for them, they receive more, and if you burn less, they get less. If it did work that way, then all Westerners, when they died, would become poor ghosts. For in the West, paper money is very seldom burned. And if money is not burned, then the ghosts won't have any money to use, right? And so they would be poor ghosts. It isn't that way. If people believe that, I think they are wrong. Burning paper money is simply symbolic, as it is said. Thoroughly go through the funeral rites for parents and the worship of ancestors. It's a way of showing one's concern and one's respect for their memory. But it's very difficult to say whether those things really have any use or not. Hungry ghosts for several hundred great compounds never have one drop of water to drink. If any of the good things we have to eat enter the mouth of a hungry ghost, they turn into the fire and burn its mouth. So, all of you think it over. How can perfectly good things to eat turn into fire in the mouths of those ghosts? This happens because of their comic obstacles. I remember in the 33rd year of the Chinese Republic, which was, which was uh, 1044 in the Hunan province on the mainland of China. There was a famine. There was no harvest that year, so there was no grain and people had nothing to eat. Then there also were many locusts that appeared in the sky. Locusts blackened out the sun. They were so thick in the air that people could catch a whole net full with a single random swipe and they cooked them to eat because they had nothing else. The locusts had eaten all the crops they had planted and so they were going to eat the locusts in return. But once the locusts had been cooked, no one could bear to eat them because they turned into excrement. That was due to the comic obstacles of those living beings. So everything depends upon living beings, comma. Hungry ghosts never find anything to eat because their comic obstacles are too heavy. Good things to eat turn to fire in their mouths because their comic obstacles obstruct them. If you talk in detail about hungry ghosts, you'll find there are millions of categories of them and you could never describe them all. They enter the nest of evil views. Evil views means devil views, those that are not proper devil knowledge and devil views. They are confused by the thick forest of stupidity. The dense ooze of stupidity confuses them. They follow devil paths outside ways that are not proper and correct and practice inverted conduct. Everything they do is upside down. They are like blind people who do not have guides. They are like people who have no eyes, 
who have no one to lead them, no one to point out the way, roads which do not lead to escape, roads which do not lead out of the three realms. They think lead to escape. They think that they are the roads to ending birth and death. They enter into the states of demons. They are turned by demonic states and become part of the demon king's retinue and are seized by evil bandits. They are trapped by the demons and do what the demons tell them to do. They are caught with the demon's might and become far removed from the Buddha's intentions. They no longer follow what the Buddha's intend. I should pull them out of such danger and difficulty. Now I shall save them so they escape from suffering and attain to bliss. I should get them off that dangerous road out of all those difficult circumstances and cause them to dwell in the city of the fearlessnesses of all wisdom, so that they dwell in the four fearlessness in the city of all wisdom. If they dwell in the city of all wisdom, they will be able to fall into the three evil paths because they will have wisdom. They will know enough not to follow deviant views. And because they won't run after deviant views, they will have proper knowledge and proper views. To dwell in proper knowledge and proper views is itself the city of all wisdom, the city of having proper and correct wisdom. There is an announcement which is that Gold Mountain Temple has produced a freak. It's a Hong Shua. How is he a freak? It's because next month he wants to start on the first Monday and but once every three steps from Gold Will Temple in Los Angeles to the city of 10,000 Buddhas in Northern California. Why does he want to do something so stupid as that? It's because he knows that his offense karma from the past is very heavy and is, he is afraid of falling into the three evil destinies. Now he wants to use his merit and virtue from bowing every three steps to repent of his previous offense karma. Also, he hopes that the merit and virtue from this will prevent disasters in the world and that all of humankind will be at peace. So I say that he is a modern day freak. Now I think that everybody who has a question can ask it. Whether it's a big question or a little question, an old question or a young question, all may be asked. We have a lot of people here and we divide them up according to ability. The old will answer the old questions, the young will answer the young questions, the good will answer the good questions and the bad will answer the bad questions. We divide them up according to categories. Question. I'm a little confused about the road to enlightenment, which I presume is the basis for our being here to become enlightened. And I presume also that it takes more than one lifetime to become enlightened because we don't learn very fast. And I hear that a bot say that we lose the knowledge that we gained during each lifetime. So I wonder what it is that we carry over on that road to enlightenment. Answer, karma, not necessarily karmic obstacles, just karma. If you do good, you have good karma. If you do evil, you have bad karma. Question, I still don't understand. I want to know what carries over lifetime after lifetime that least one to become enlightened. Can you carry over work in one lifetime to the next lifetime to achieve it eventually? Answer, you can carry it over. However, unfortunately, not just what you do, but what all the people do is not completely good. It's a mixture of good and evil. Just take people here who are cultivating the way, for example. Just talk about the people at Gold Mountain Temple. They cultivate and take two steps ahead, but at the very least, retreat one step backwards. I have a disciple who knelt before me and said, Sure, fool. Every time I advance one step, I retreat three steps. There is nothing I can do about it. So you see, the problem is there. Question, is the bad carried over too? Answer, yes, you take the bad with you as well. Whatever color you stain your white cloth is the color you take along with you. The white cloth represents the self-nature and 
Dying is a color stands for your creating good and bad karma. Question. Yesterday you talked about how people who have killed in their last life sometimes live a day and sometimes live a month or a few months and they find it very difficult. We tend to grieve so much more when someone is younger. My cousin just lost a seven-month-old baby boy and it's so hard to understand the reason for that. Did you say that when someone dies at such a young age it's because they killed in their past life? Answer. You should realize that when in the person's past life he killed some kind of creature or other, the friends and relatives of that creature also were very grieved. Not to talk about anything else, just say he killed a chicken. When a chicken is killed, all the other chickens start crackling sadly, crying over the chicken that was killed, or take crows. If you catch a small crow, the crow's mother will do her best to get the baby crow back, even if it means losing her whole life. This happens among most animals and birds. For example, if you catch a mother hen's baby chicks, of course, this is the scientific age. The most chickens are hatched in incubators. Science has dispensed with mother hens. No one protects the chicks, and so you can easily take and kill them and eat their flesh. But when the old mother hen is out walking with 10 or so small chicks, if anybody grasps, grabs one of them, the old mother hen will go to war with that person. That actually happens. We feel it is painful when someone in our family or circle of friends dies. When we kill someone in the family or circle of another kind of creature, the relatives and friends of that creature also mourn. It was the same way. Sutra he further makes the following reflection. reflection. All living beings are swallowed up in great torrent waves. They enter the flow of desire, the flow of existence, the flow of ignorance, and the flow of views. They revolve in the whirlpool of birth and death. They toss and turn in the river of love. They are carried away by the galloping flood and have no leisure to contemplate. They follow after awakens, uh, awakenings to desire, awakenings to hatred, awakenings to harming, and do not give them up. In the midst of that, they are seized by the rakshasas of the view of the body. They are on the point of internal entry so that to the dense forest of love and desire. They bring forth deep, defined attachment towards that, what they greedily love. They dwell in the fertile plain of bride. They settle in the town of the six places. They have no one good to save them. They have no one to rescue them. I should bring forth the thought of great compassion towards them and use all my good rules to rescue and save them. So they have no calamities or disasters. Leave the defilements are at peace and dwell on the drought island of all wisdom. Commentary. He further makes the following reflection. The Bodhisattva who has certified to the second ground, the ground of living filth, thinks as follows. Before he wanted to cause living beings to dwell in the city of the unconditioned of all wisdom, this time his contemplation is, all living beings are swallowed up in the great torrent's waves. The great torrents are just as when a great flood pours in the sea. It causes great waves to rise up, and if anybody stands where this great tide occurs, they will be pulled under by the current and drowned by the water. They enter the flow of desire, that fast flood and the flow of existence. They enter into the flood of the three realms and the twenty-five existences. All the three existences and the flow of ignorance and the flow of views. They enter into the flowing river of ignorance and not understanding anything of lack of comprehension. Comprehension. They revolve in the whirlpool of birth and death. In the sea of birth and death, 
they are caught up in the whirlpools formed by the waves. They toss and turn in the river of love. They are spun around by love and emotion, which are like a rampaging river. They are carried away by the galloping flood. The waves stir up the current very fiercely, and it is like a galloping horse. At any moment, the person could be carried into the sea and have no leisure to contemplate why this is happening. There is no time to observe what was going on. They follow after awakenings, awakenings to desire, awakenings to hatred. They awaken to views of desire and of hatred, to the knowledge of how to have thoughts of desire and how to lose their tempers. Awakenings to harming. They learn how to do harm. They flow among, with them. They flow along with them and do not give them up. They flow along with the currents of desire, hatred, and harming, which they never really quench. In the midst of that, they are seized by the rakshasas of the view of body of a body. Once view of a body is like a rakshasa ghost, they are ensnared and snared by their attachments. They are on the point of eternal entry to the dense forest of love and desire. The rakshasa ghost says them and drag them into the very thick forest of love and desire. They bring forth deep, defined attachment towards what they greedily love. These people develop deep, defined attachments to whatever they feel greed and love for. They dwell in the fertile plain, plain of pride. They inhabit the expanse of haughtiness and arrogance. They settle in the town of the six places. They listen to the order of the six faculties: eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. They have no one good to save them. They fall into the uh, situation in which there is no one able to use clever expedient devices to save them. They have no one to rescue them. No one can rescue those kinds of people. I should bring forth the thoughts of great compassion towards them. The Bodhisattva himself says, "I should have great kindness and compassion towards those kinds of living beings, cause them to live suffering and attain bliss, and use all my good rules to rescue and save them. I should employ all the good rules I have accumulated from cultivating to save those living beings, so they have no calamities or disasters. So living beings who are like that." Don't have disasters before them, so they live in defilement, are、uh, at peace, so that they separate from defiled dramas and attain to purity and dwell on the jeweled island of, of all wisdom, the precious island of all wisdom. Sutra. He also makes the following reflection: All living beings live in the prison of the world. They have many sufferings and troubles. They constantly cherish love and hate. For themselves, they become worried and afraid. They are bound by the heavy fetters of greed and desire. They are blocked and obstructed by the thick forest of ignorance. From within the three realms, not one can by himself escape. I should cause them to leave behind the three existences forever and dwell within the non-obstruction of great nirvana. Commentary: He, the Bodhisattva on the second ground, the ground of living filth, also makes the following reflection. He says, "All living beings live in the prison of the world. In be their being in the world is like being in jail. They are unable to escape from the three realms, and so it is said, the three realms are like a jail. Birth and death are like shackles." Those of the two vehicles look upon the three realms as a prison. We are people. We people are within birth and death, like a bird in a cage. They have many sufferings and troubles. When we are born into this world, we have lots of suffering and lots of afflictions which we can't escape. They constantly cherish love and hate. They are always loving and hating, having the suffering of being separated from what they love. And being together with what they hate, and this is constantly going on. For themselves, they become worried and afraid. 
They always worry and are scared, being afraid of not having food to eat, fearing they will have no clothes to wear, and worrying what they will not have any place to live. There are so many things they are afraid of. They also fear not having money to use. Or not having sons or daughters. If they do have sons or daughters, they fear having no grandsons or granddaughters. They are always worried and afraid. They are bound by the heavy fetters of greed and desire. They are never able to stop their greed. When they have been greedy the whole life long, and the time comes to die, they can't take anything with them. Greed and desire are like fetters. Like a ball and chain that tie you up, greed and desire fetter you, so you cannot obtain liberation. They are blocked and obstructed by the thick forest of ignorance, the dense woods of not understanding anything, of lacking wisdom, hinders and obstructs one's own wisdom. From within the three realms, not one can by himself escape. No one can, on his own, escape from the desire realm, the form realm, and the formless realm, those three realms. So the Bodhisattva says, I should cause them to leave behind the three existences forever. I should cause living beings to throw off the three existences once and for all. Existence in the desire realm, existence in the form realm, existence in the formless realm and dwell within the non-obstruction of great nirvana, dwell in the state of the four virtues of nirvana, permanence, bliss, true self, purity. Sutra, he further makes the following reflection, all living beings are attached to a self. They are in the cave dwelling of all the skandhas and do not seek to escape. They rely upon the, the empty mass of the six places. They give rise to the four kinds of upside-down conduct. They are invaded by the poisonous snakes of the four elements. They are harmed and killed by the vengeful thieves of the five skandhas. They undergo limitless suffering. I should cause them to dwell in the most supreme place of non-attachment, that is, in unsurpassed nirvana where all obstructions are destroyed. He further makes the following reflection. All living beings have minds that are based and narrow. They do not walk the most suffering path of all knowledge. Although they may wish to escape, they merely like the, the vehicle of sound heroes and Pratyeka Buddhas. I should cause them to dwell in vast great Buddha dharmas, vast great wisdom. Commentary. He also makes the following reflection. The Bodhisattva on the second ground says, all living beings are attached. What are they attached to? To a self. They are in the cave dwelling of the five skandhas. The five skandhas are form, feeling, thinking, activities, and consciousness, which are like a very dark cave dwelling and do not seek to escape. It never occurs to them to get out of that cave. They rely upon the empty mass of the six places. Basically, the six places, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, are an empty conglomeration, but they base themselves upon them. They give rise to the four kinds of upside-down conduct. The four ways of being upside-down are mistaking the impermanent for the permanent, mistaking for what is not bliss for bliss, mistaking what is not self for self, mistaking what is not pure for pure. Those four ways of being upside down confuse one's self nature. They are invaded by the poisonous snakes of the four elements. See how fierce the poisonous snakes of the four elements are. The four elements are earth, water, fire, wind. They are harmed and killed by the vengeful thieves of the five skandhas. The vengeful thieves of the five skandhas form, feeling, thinking, activities, and consciousness harm and kill them. They undergo limitless suffering. The suffering they undergo is infinite. I should cause them to dwell in the most suffering place of non-attachment. I should teach living beings who are suffering like that to dwell where there is not attachment, the highest location. 
that is, in unsurpassed nirvana, where all obstructions are destroyed. I should cause all living beings to obtain the happiness of having all obstacles eradicated and dwelling in the state of nirvana, which is the very highest. He further makes the following reflection. He thinks, all living beings have minds that are base and narrow. Living beings are, have petty minds, which are very inferior. They do not walk the most supreme path of all knowledge. They don't cultivate the very highest path of all wisdom. Although they may wish to escape, they merely like the vehicle, the vehicle of self-healers and Pratika Buddhas. Even though they might want to get out of the three realms, the desire realm, the form realm, and the formless realm. Nonetheless, the measure of their minds is very small. They only like the South Hero Vihigo, the Pratika Buddha Vihigo, the low and inferior way of thinking of the two Vihigos. I should cause them to dwell in the vast, great Buddha Dharma's vast, great wisdom. Now that I realize the South Heroes and Pratika Buddhas are of the small Vihigo, I should teach all living beings to dwell in great Vihigo Buddha Dharma, that vast, great wisdom, so they obtain limitless and boundless great wisdom. Sutra, Disciples of the Buddha The Bodhisattva in that way protects and maintains the precepts and is well able to increase his thought of kindness and compassion. Disciples of the Buddha The Bodhisattva who dwells on this, the ground of living filth, because of the power of his vows, comes to see many Buddhas, that is, he sees many hundreds of Buddhas, many thousands of Buddhas, many hundreds of thousands of Buddhas, many millions of Buddhas, many hundreds of millions of Buddhas, many thousands of millions of Buddhas, many hundreds of thousands of millions of Buddhas, and so forth, up to and including seeing many hundreds of thousands of millions of Nayutas of Buddhas. In the presence of all Buddhas, he, with a vast and great mind, a deep mind, a reverent and respectful mind, serves and makes offerings to them by respectfully giving them clothing, food and drink, bedding and medicines and all the necessities of life. He also makes offerings to all the assembled Sangha and he transfers those good rules to Nanusara Samyak Sambuddhi in the presence of all Buddhas with a reverent mind. He further receives and practices the dramas of the ten wholesome paths. He follows what he has received even up to Bodhi and never forgets and loses it. Commentary Vara Treasury Bodhisattva calls out again. All of you disciples of the Buddha, the Bodhisattva in that way protects and maintains the precepts. He holds the precepts like that and is well able to increase his thought of kindness and compassion. He becomes more and more kind and compassionate. All of you disciples of the Buddha, the Bodhisattva who dwells on this, the ground of living filth, because of the power of his vows, the vows that he has made, comes to see many Buddhas, that is, he sees many hundreds of Buddhas, many thousands of Buddhas, he can see many hundreds of thousands of Buddhas, many millions of Buddhas, many hundreds of millions of Buddhas, many hundreds of thousands of millions of Buddhas, and so forth, continually increasing the number up to and including seeing many hundreds of thousands of millions of Nayutas of Buddhas. In the presence of all Buddhas, where all Buddhas are, he, with a vast and great mind, a deep mind, a reverent and respectful mind, serves and makes offerings to them by respectfully giving them clothing, food, and drink, bedding and medicines, and all the necessities of life. He offers up the four types of offerings and other items which people use to maintain their lives. He also makes offerings to all the assembled Sangha, all left home people and he transfers those good rules to Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, the unsurpassed proper equal right enlightenment. In the presence of all Buddhas with a reverent mind, he further receives and practices the dramas of the ten wholesome paths, the ten good acts. He follows what he has received even up to Bodhi. 
till he becomes a Buddha and never forgets or loses it. He never loses track of or forgets those Dharma doors.